your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Blessed be, heed the words I call to thee. Honor the old ones in name and deed, hearken not to others' greed. Pray to the moon when she is round, luck with you shall then abound. Respect the earth, the sky, the sea, as you will it, so mote it be. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron on the Para X Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet, and welcome to Stirring the Cauldron. Now, I opened the show with a lively tarantella, which is an Italian celebration song that dates back to the Middle Ages. I didn't know too much about it, so I kind of was just looking around. And legend states that between the 15th and 17th centuries, an epidemic of tarantism (laughs) swept through the town of Taranto in southern Italy, and this as a result of being bit by a poisonous spider. Um, The victim, which is referred to as the Tarantata, was almost always a woman, but never a high-ranking lady or one of aristocratic upbringing. But once bitten by the spider, um, the person would fall into a trance and could only be cured by frenzied dancing. So people would surround the victim with musicians and they would play mandolins and guitars and tambourines in search of the correct rhythm. And then each beat would have a different effect on the tarantata, causing various movements and gestures. And once the correct rhythm was found, it almost certainly cured the person, which is, you know, my little bit of trivia today, because I wondered why it started slow and then just kept getting faster and faster and faster. So that being said, (laughs) my guest tonight is Professor Kingsley, Nicholas Kingsley, and um, He's with the Gray School of Magic, and you'll remember him from being on before. And um, Nicholas is a student of magic for more than a decade, um, within, with his focus being on wizardry. Now, having grown up with his grimoire for the apprentice wizard as his constant companion, he would dare to consider himself a true wizard at heart and a child of the teachings endorsed by the Gray School. He, uh, he was honored to have been welcomed into the GSW facility in the summer of 2017 at the age of 23, becoming the youngest professor to ever teach at the school. And that's quite an accomplishment that he takes great pride in. 
Now, his day-to-day is filled with teaching at the school as professor in the Department of Wizardry, um, serving faithfully as assistant to the headmaster, founding magical orders, and undertaking such projects as need to be or as whim demands. Um, he's, he's busy, and, and, you know, we keep saying the word wizard, and a lot of people aren't really sure what a wizard is. So we're going to kind of get into that and a few other things. So, Mary, meet Nicholas, and it's nice having you back for a bit more cauldron stirring. Well, thank you. It's lovely to be back. I, myself, am always a fan of a well-stirred cauldron, and so I wanted to make sure that I was with the very best to stir this latest, you know, coming of cauldron goodness. Yes, well, there is goodness, and then there is goodness, and we're going to cover so many things, and You know, being a wizard, um, part of your path is to teach, and, you know, mine is as well. And people often hear words, and they kind of sort of know what they mean or who who or what they're attached to. But but you've you've broken it down a little bit, made made it a little bit easier. So let's start at the beginning. Um, What is a wizard? Let's see. Oh, yes, there we are. It's a good question. Wizardry is a difficult thing to pin down, especially in the world today. I think it often conjures to mind those sorts of uh, cinematic images of the lightning throwing old men in tattered robes or uh, young men with lightning scars or young men doing something. And this often leads, I think, to the uh, understanding that uh, these things are fantastical. Mm -hmm. And that they don't exist in reality or that we aren't there. But, you know, through through stories, through the mythos that we create and share as a culture and society all across the world, we grow. We teach our lessons. And and through these lessons, we remain connected. And this interconnected fabric that we weave is the tapestry that the wizard seeks to sort of follow along with and keep care of. And so wizardry in the world today is someone who takes up that cause of pursuing wisdom and pursuing that path of service to the world around them and building up the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. Good start. Now, on your website, your title is Master Wizard. Now, that would be probably, if I'm not mistaken, equivalent to maybe High Priest or High Priestess in other magical paths? Uh, Well, so, so Master Wizard is a tricky one, right? That's... Part marketing, which is rule two of wizardry. We'll get to that later on. But, you know, the master wizard denotes that I've walked a path of journeymanship myself. I've gone through those ropes and been through those trials and been on this path of wizardry for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And that when I look for insight or I seek new lessons, these are experiences that I've had that I extrapolate on, that I use, you know, introspection and run past my peers use the the knowledge and wisdom of my community that I've created over my own life in order to better facilitate answers to queries presented by my apprentices. And so this is the mastery of wizardry. Uh, And in mastery of wizardry, that doesn't mean that that wizard knows all the things that it means to be a wizard or is all things wizardly. It's just the way that they approach wizardry and the trials that they have passed to sort of reach that place. Um, You know, it's a non-secular thing, so I'm not sure where it would fall in line with a high priest. I'd say a high priest and priestess are certainly more. Uh, it's a it's a significant spiritual dedication, I think, to to wear that title, and requires uh, a different sort of dedication. Maybe not more or less, but a different sort certainly. Yeah, well, it's kind of like a coven title, you know. I mean, the the pecking order it seems in covens. Now, I don't belong to a coven. I'm a solitary, so I. You know, I maybe I'm not a team player. I don't know, but um, <laughs> you know, it's it's all that infighting and getting to the top. You know, and and there are a lot of great comments out there. I'm not saying that, but just for me, I'd rather argue with myself. Um, but I think you know um, that's where you hear most often. You know, someone is a high priest or a high priestess of a particular coven or maybe their own path or something like that. Certainly, certainly. I think that uh, part of that title and part of that hierarchy is to really establish order within those smaller groups. Yeah. And that, you know, through the exterior lens, you know, someone might be a high priest of one coven, and that's not necessarily equivalent to another coven. 
Mm-hmm. And so with a lot of these titles that we use in wizardry, they're applied by exteriors to us instead of claiming them for ourselves or what, what it might be. And it has to be of consensus by that lot. So my peers think of me as a master wizard, and so I'm a master wizard. But my peers may one day say, whoa, that Nicholas, he's got you know not quite long enough of a mustache. Better knock that title back down a rank. So, I mean... You know, it definitely depends on uh, your standing in the world and how we interact with our our peers and our community and I think our integrity. You know, a lot of that comes down to what mastery of wizardry is, is sort of the refinement of the application of the philosophy. And when we boiled that philosophy down into its most applicable uh, format and we utilize that as a uh, path to live one's life or a living philosophy, so to speak, that you take on that ideology and that you walk it, you speak it, you know it, and by proxy then expand upon its knowledge and its synch- or its, uh, you know, its wave. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, I think that is more what the, the title Master Wizard mean. It's not, and in wizardry, the titles don't denote one's superiority over another. It mm-hmm. denotes their authority. And the authority comes not from the structure that they're a part of, but rather authority in reference to one's knowledge or one's wisdom or experience. And so it's something that one's peers sort of bestow upon you, you know, at a point when others look at you and go, oh, well, you've had apprentices and you've taught this, and so you are a master wizard to me. That's a a thing of pride and honor, but it's not something I think that you would see, you know, of of wizards using as a, um, what would you say, perhaps a a way to lord over someone Mm. and, We'll get into maybe later on about service and the pillars of wizardry and how that works and why exactly one wouldn't use that title in that way. Good. Yeah. Well, no, you just explained something very, very easily and, and very intelligently. And so, yeah, you explained it nicely. Thank you. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> That's always good to hear. I'm yes. glad I got there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but do, um, do wizards have covens as witches do? Well, so a wizard, I mean, a wizard is sort of a unique sort of tool out there in the world for the for the greater energies that be to make manifest through. A wizard builds communities. And so in that sense, around a wizard, a sort of community develops. And that might be considered a coven in sort of the loose sense. Mm-hmm. But a wizard doesn't specifically seek to structure the coven or to isolate power or to draw these sorts of things in that manner. Rather, the heroes uh, of the world sort of are attracted to the wizard, you know, like a a moth to the flame sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And through these heroes, they often go off and do miraculous things, you know, quite quite fantastic stuff, really. Mm -hmm. And the wizard's role in in the world is not to acquire that power for self, but really to inspire it in others and to build that up. And so, you know, I don't know if a wizard builds a coven per se, but they certainly do build community. And that's a big – that's really the base of the wizard's power. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about that community for a minute because, um, you know, it sounds simple enough, but it probably isn't. I mean, there's probably more to it than um, just, okay, we're building a community. I mean, it has to do with relationships. It has to do with all kinds of different things, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when one says we're, we're building a community, you're like, oh, good. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to hot dogs and, you know, whenever lemonade, that's, com- that's community. Kumbaya. Yeah. That. yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So what does, look, what does building a community look like? Well, I think it first starts around you as a wizard realizing your own agency, your own talents, your own excellences, these things that make you unique and special in the world. And isolating those talents in a way that you can present them in a format that sort of reaches other people and helps them take on those skills as well in addition to their own. Uh, this is where the philosophy sort of differs from a lot of, lot of different philosophies, honestly, where it says you need to replace your understanding of the world with this one. Rather, it is an addendum to what you already know. Take this and then run forward. So uh, the master wizard or the, the journeyman wizard, perhaps even more accurately, out in the world after finishing their journeymanship, let's say they want to build a community of uh, individuals in their town to help deal with the suicide rate. Now, this is a serious problem that you know happens a lot, and I don't think it quite gets enough talking about, but it's a terrible issue, you know, and um, it's something that uh, an ear lent to can be the world of difference a lot of times. So let's say a wizard wants to start this community and build up 
a network of support for that specific task. Well, that might be one way they serve the community they're a part of, if there's a specific need for that. And when a wizard enters into a community, and they have to decide what that community is for themselves. Is it the people they live around? Is it the orders they're a part of? Is it you know, their family immediate? You know, there's a lot of different definitions that the wizard might apply the, the term community to. But then it revolves around uh, analyzing those specific individuals within that community and how you can best utilize your talents to bring their talents both to the forefront of their lives and also in a way that challenges them to improve and succeed. Uh, one of these mantras that we often say as wizards is that we, we thrive in agency. As a wizard, we really like to recognize and celebrate the agency of the individual as best we can and prepare them in a way with tools, lessons, experiences, and wisdoms that give them all the assets they need to really tackle and address the problems that are brought in today's world. Um, and this is, the, this is the service that wizards provide to their communities, and it's varied. Now, one wizard might provide this by having a puppet show you know, for their community because it's needed and it's that relief that the world feels necessary there, the performance wizard. In another community, it might be beset by you know, sickness and plague or, or sadness and dis- depression. And so you might see a lifeways wizard or a, or a wart cunning wizard really take root there, no pun intentional, and, and really spread their magic to that community. But you see, we focus on these, these aspects of the world around us. Uh, and the real goal of the wizard, in any sense, is to be of service. Mm-hmm. And so the the community is a construct of service. The whole idea of community is one built around the the longevity of its of its members and and those involved. And so, as a wizard, we want to seek to build those structures of survival of of uh, incubation, of excellence, of health and happiness in a way that doesn't lead them towards conflict with other communities, right? This is a, this is a thing we see a lot in the world where uh, I think nationalism is a good example of one of these things that can go very, very dangerously awry when it's not, uh, when it's not looked at, you know, when you aren't aware of what's happening. And people take that path and they get all riled up and they think, why, it's us versus them. And then, bam, there you have it. You've got a a diversive mentality. And so as a wizard, you have a responsibility to guide those communities under your care into developing uh, policies and ideologies that support an inclusive environment as its base note, rather than being an afterthought or addendum to constitution and, and ideology. So, you know, when we say that we want to be of service, when we want to build communities, what we're really saying is we want to be of help to the people who need it around us. And that's such a varied task. And so this is why the Gray School has, you know, its, its many facets and why wizardry is, of course, you know, the pursuit of wisdom being a very vast and wide and open thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that it's, it's one of these paths that we see less walked in the world today. Um, so we want to, we want to, of course, focus more on that and bring that back around. And then as we build these communities, we want them to, you know, the hero mentality comes to play and the idea that, you know, communities need things to rally around and strive for. And so the wizard then has the responsibility to help build with the community as opposed to for the community a rallying cry that is both supportive to itself but also inclusive of other groups outside of itself. And this way we can avoid this sort of uh, tribalistic conflict that sometimes comes of actions which are in intention very good, but because of a lack of foresight and planning often end in a very diversive and very confrontational manner. Yeah, that's the world around us today in, in every aspect. Um, now, you know, we as witches, we... we it's self. It's a self-proclaimed title. We don't go to somewhere and they say, "Okay, you know," and, and hit you with the scepter and say you're a witch. Um, we we <laughs> are self. Yeah, we are self-proclaimed. Now the same goes for wizards, does it not? Well, so now that is a tricky one. So some wizards, of course, uh, they do. You know, they just spring up and they're just there one day and they've got the title wizard. And you go, "Well, yesterday you were not a wizard, and here you are, wizarded up." And that's all well and good. And I think really it comes out of your community first calling you one. I think that the true wizards, in the sense that long ago, and this is not uh, in tone with the modern uh, druidry, of course, which I think has many, um, many great 
boons over the ancient version. You know, knowledge is a great thing to continue advancing. Yeah. But in those days of yore, the Druids would never call themselves a Druid. Uh, that was not the way of things. Rather, other people referred to them mm -hmm. as the Druids. And so this is the same way that the wizard starts, right? Uh, a wizard would never refer to themselves as a wizard to start. One might take the path of wizardry and introduce themselves as apprentice wizard so-and-such. And that's a title in itself. But to be called a wizard by your peers, either by the name itself or to be known as wise, uh, and wizardry is Old English for the, the wise one, mm -hmm. you know, this sort of path uh, really requires two aspects. It requires the validation of yourself from yourself, you know, the knowledge of who you are, the drive forward to be of service, the, the wherewithal to, to stay to the path. And then it also requires consent of those who you are around. No one can take advice that they don't want to take, and it's important to remind yourself of that as a wizard. And so, you know, we again look back to the community and where that wizard's base of power is. The community knows you as a wizard, and in that sense, you are granted and given the title of wizard. You earn that by being wise to your community. Um, and I think that's the best way to go about any title, really, is that it's all, it's all well and good to give it to yourself and to know it, and then in time earn it. And I think in that way it's the same, right? One can call themselves a witch, and they, they know they're a witch, and they feel they're a witch. And their community in time may know them as a witch. And there's a deeper magic, I think, in that shared knowledge of one's role in that world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, imagine the small town. Let's, let's draw a card from that. Rural Arkansas, let's say. So in rural Arkansas, we have a wizard. And uh, her, her town knows her as a very wise person. And they come to her for all these things. And there she is, and the town knows her as a wizard. And, and she relates to them under that title. It has a power and mystique. It has a story to it. And this uh, is shared amongst the people who are within. So I think the, the way that I certainly acquired the title of wizard and many others in the world today is that their community gives them that title first. And then them as the individual have to make a choice. You know, for me personally, it was here I met my life. You know, a lot of my life is dedicated to the path of wizardry and our school and these sorts of things like this and, and being the best wizard one can be. And the other path is interested in, you know, these other things that, that don't really mesh, you know, or I want to go do, um, you know, wherever it may be, be a little silly, get a little drunk, do all the things that maybe aren't as wise as one might think they should be. <laughs> and uh, so there's a, there's a responsibility and a power in the labeling of wizard. And when my community started to look at me as, an, as a person of, uh, of wisdom or as a place of inspiration or example, it was my responsibility then to make a choice. And I could say, please don't look at me this way. This is not who I want you to look at me as. I don't feel that I can live up to these standards. Or I could say, you know, I'm going to do the best I can to live up to the standards of this community and serve as an example for what it means to be a wizard. Now, that doesn't mean I always get it right, but that is the path I chose. And it's from, you know, the mistakes and failures that we make that we learn to move forward. And that's what keeps the title valid and relevant as you press on. If the world knows you as a fool, then it's hard to be, to be wise and carry the title, you know, wise one or wizard. And so, you know, it's just as much as the confidence in self as the confidence reflected by the community and the people you serve. And both of those are equally difficult to earn. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. Probably harder to earn it from yourself than from the community. Yes, absolutely. Now, a minute ago, you said that um, you were referring to a wizard and you said she. And that's a question that comes up all the time. Are, and, and you just answered it. Are wizards always men? Yes, always. <laughs> no, of course not. You know, wizard, wizard means wise one, and so uh, the Gray School of Wizardry, wizardry as a concept, really came out of out of the um, or the organized form of wizardry. I should say, there's been wizards around for quite some time, but the school and the sort of approaches we take to it came out of this response to young men looking for something to do in the metaphysical community, and why there they were, and they wanted a title, and wizard fit, and it was historical, da da da. And young women were looking for the same thing. They said, well, you know, I want to be wise. <laughs> I know a lot of ladies who are pretty wise. And, you know, it's very hard to sit there as, a, as someone claiming to be wise and say, I don't know any wise women. <laughs> That's just silly. So, of course, 
you know, it referred to both, and the school opened its doors to everyone who wanted to take on that path. Um, now, of course, you know, it's a, it's a journey, and it's something that one has to walk. So it's a path which is open to everyone, but not everyone finishes. Uh, and that's, I think, an important thing to note, that it is a journey, and, and it's a difficult one. Um, in that difficulty, uh, your gender is not relevant. What's relevant is your dedication to that, those cornerstones which make us unique and, and put us as the role of the mentor or the wizard in that, in that community uh, or, or story, you know, the story of the, the world around us. Um, and so in this way, when an apprentice enrolls in our school, we, we give them the title apprentice. They own that. And it's not sir or madam or, or any variant thereof. It's apprentice magical name. And this is to denote that you have, you have decided to walk the path of the wizard, to take on the role of the seven levels of the gray school, and at the end to undertake your, your you know, wizard's quest, your practicum, and do good in the world, you know, to walk that. And I think that uh, young women, elder women, elder men, young men, there's a lot of wisdom in the world, and there's a lot of gems that need a little polishing, but they are brilliant underneath that rough layer. Um, if you tell the wizard archetype, you know, someone born into that role, let's say this young young lady is born into really what it means to be a wizard. She's got it nailed. Just innately knows the three rules, walks the walk, speaks the talk, all the good things. And she's there and she's told the only role open for her is the, you know, the path of the heroine now is, is becoming a more pro, uh, uh, prevalent one or a supporting character to someone else's life. In, in a non-meaningful way, you know, or in a very uh, sort of shaped way. Um, you know, balderdash, absolute nonsense. You know, these young women who are coming into the world today will shape our future. You know, this is, this is the new millennium, the, the 2020 vision, the shaping of the world. All these new things are coming. And to do this properly, we need the input and perspective of all those who carry wisdom around us. And so, you know, no, wizardry is not just for men. It's for those who want to walk the path uh, and who are dedicated to striving really for that wisdom and knowledge of self and knowledge of the world, you know, who are dedicated to service and who want to make a, a significant difference in the world but aren't really too bothered about getting the credit for doing so. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting rule because one of the rules of wizardry is to take credit. So, well, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy for sure. But, you know, women are, are very wise indeed on the whole so far. I'd have to argue probably wiser than men. I've seen some, I've seen some pretty nonsensical stuff. So, you know, I think we've got to trust our gut on these things. And wizardry is, in the modern sense, in the world today, it is a path open for those who seek to wield their wisdom constructively and proactively. Mm -hmm. How many, um, uh, what's the percentage, would you say, I mean, just a guess, of, of women who decide that they want the title, to, they want to be wizards as compared to men? It's actually at our school at the moment, this is we're, we're a fact we're quite proud of, is we're, we're darn near spirit right down the middle. I think wow. it's... Uh, I think it's 46% men. No, 46% women, I beg your pardon. 46% women. Uh, so that's, we're working, of course, to make things all equal, but, you know, you can only do so much. And it's, it's important to us that we just welcome people who are interested in the path. We don't want to force it on people or say, right. yeah. you know, this is the way to do stuff or anything like that. But those who are called to it um, and not turning them away when they get here, you know, that's another thing that's important is that, the young lady who comes to the gates and wants to walk the path of the wizard is more than welcome. The virtual gates, of course, although mm. news on that later. Good. Uh, and so, <laughs> <laughs> yes, so there's some very interesting things coming later. But, um, you know, for that, that particular, there's a young, there's a show on Netflix right now. I'm sorry, I'm a bit babbly, but there's a show on Netflix called uh, The Good Witch, I think. Mm -hmm. and it's this young, young witch attending the witch school which if we could only all attend witch school, that'd be fantastic. Yeah. But uh, there she is. And I think one of these episodes that had come to my attention was an episode where uh, she wants to wield a staff. 
And in this mythos, uh, she is not allowed a staff, as a staff is a uh, a, a man only object. Of, of I think they're called palindromes or phalindromes or something mm-hmm. like this. Some word in Latin for a for a you know man only item. And mm-hmm. so there it is. And she's not allowed it. And so the whole oh. episode really revolves around her building this staff in secret and overcoming the obstacles placed before her. And through this, we find a wonderful talent that witches have for wielding staves. Mm -hmm. And at the same time uh, in the show, the wizards are all boys and the wizards discovered that they have a wonderful talent for chants and songs, which had previously only been Mm -hmm. for the witches. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so this whole story really revolves around something that is at the core of wizardry, which is that the world around us is full of lessons. It's full of opportunities for us to dive in and really explore what it means to be that thing. And to, uh, to look through those examples of others, the diversity of thought and culture and, and history and perspective. You know, you, the perspective of the Native American is one who is different from the early cowboy. And they both have a story to tell. Each unique and fascinating and full of these just amazing i mean if you've ever read the uh the stories i mean the diaries of the the uh, early american cowboy holy moly they were just on a mission you know they were they were on this mission and then we read the stories or we hear the stories of the native americans on the other side this terrible tragedy as they fight for their land i mean there's this dichotomy of information and potency which the wizard then walks between and says there's a story here in both hands. There's a lesson from both. Both have a place in this world at their own perspective times and places. Balanced with each other, they create wisdom. You know, there's a, a power in in the American ingenuity, you know, the cowboy, that that drive west, all this sort of stuff that made made that nation powerful. And at the same time, there's a saga of loss and consideration of the world and a deep spiritual awakening of a people as they are in the brink of, of their exodus, you know, from, from reality as far as they know at the time. You know, it's terrifying. Mm-hmm. And this dichotomy of worlds lends us a perspective which avails itself to, to opportunities of application today. We can look at that same moment of the American cowboy, the Native American, as they struggle over the same world, you know, worlds ideologies conflicting having a hard time working out in the same space and we can look at the world today and the conflicts we suffer we need help dealing with these things these aren't things to be handled by the good old boys not to worry you know we've got it all <laughs> nonsense we need all the help we can get and wizardry is a path that helps us realize those around us who can who can really start to make these changes who can stand up in the crowd and say you know I don't, I don't want to fight you. And in Portland the other day, if I can get a little off topic here. But yeah, sure. sure. In, in Portland the other day, there was a riot. And it was uh, between the police, of course, and this, the, I think they're Antifa group. Um, I think that's what they're called. Uh, Antifa, Antifa group. And so this back and forth is going. It's very heated, very heated. And many people were hurt. And the tragedy of the event and the, the backlog of sorrows, which led to this, this anger and frustration and physical outpouring of that emotion in the form of violence was terrible, right? I don't think there's any, any arguments there that uh, the pain and suffering of a people is always one to be lamented. But specifically, there's a story that I like. And it's of an older, older man who uh, had joined the more rowdy, sort of extremist right side of the aisle, you know, flags and hitting people with sticks in the streets kind of deal. And a young uh, lady who was from the black mask throwing bricks and things group. And the two of them uh, were fighting and were able to, I'm afraid I don't know the whole story, unfortunately, but they were able to reconcile their differences in a way. They just walked away. They didn't, they weren't, they weren't happy with one another. Mm -hmm. They just walked away from it. I think there's a powerful moment of wisdom in that. Whatever realization they came to was one that said, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to hit this young lady, said the old man. I'm not going to hit this old decrepit man, said the young lady. You know? And there was this moment of just realization that they were people. Yeah. 
And I think that a lot of the anger and frustration we face in the world today is a very manufactured, very forced sort of uh, coalition of, of complaints. And I think looking past that and realizing our camaraderie, you know, your, your countrymen or your fellow peoples of a, of a sense of self or your cultural relatives or just the sense that you are human beings at the very least. If you are struggling for common ground, everyone breathes air and everyone bleeds red. And these are, these are facts we can't avoid. And so we want everyone to be welcome in the path of the wizard because it is the path that, that talks about these things that we can go and say, all right, look, you know, we have a problem here that needs addressing. And the way we want to address it is not the right way forward. You know, it's going to lead to a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. And we can avoid that if we, if we act now, you know, if we start a conversation and a dialogue and we learn these lessons of the past. And so, uh, you know, getting more back on topic now, you know, women being wizards, storytelling is a big part of this. And being able to convey the lessons of our past and our history in a meaningful, engaging format is not a trait held by men alone or women alone. It is a human uh, right. It is the thing which we inherit as as creatures of the earth and sentient, the sentient apes. You know, we have this amazing magic of stories which not only give us meaning and purpose but help us to shape the world and direct the future. And so this is a this is a responsibility that is to be borne by all uh, of our kin, not just those who are men or women, but you know the whole of the humanity who wants to walk the path of the wizard. Yeah, um, we're going to take a break. We're going to walk a little path for about two minutes, and um, when we come back, there's so much more to talk about. So everybody, stay put. We'll be right back with you. Don't go away. There's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. Are you haunted by shadow people in the middle of the night? Do you secretly love all things creepy and spooky, enjoying ghost stories and horror fiction from the best storytellers? Do you have a true ghost experience you want to share, but no one will believe you? If yes, listen to the professionals on What Are You Afraid of? Power Paranormal Show, Friday nights at 9 p.m. on ParaX Radio and at www.whatareyouafraidofpodcast.com. What What Are You Afraid afraid of? of on ParaX. Our creepy and demented hosts are on call to provide you with all your spooky needs with true ghost stories, interviews, indie music, and new horror fiction. We We are are ready ready to to scare scare you. Para X. From Haunted Road Media comes an exciting new novel by author Marla Brooks. Soul Connection, a deadly obsession. Two lost souls ripped apart by murder in another century find each other again in the present only to discover that the murderer has followed them through time. Can their love save them, or will history repeat itself? Find out in this captivating new novel by Marla Brooks, Soul Connection, A Deadly Obsession. Available now on Amazon.com and at BarnesandNoble.com. Demons. Vampires. All of this and more, Sunday nights at midnight, on the Staring into the Abyss radio show. Come, get lost with us. (laughs) Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. And we are back with my guest, Nicholas Kingsley, and uh, we're talking about wizardry tonight. And, you know, one of the, the, I guess it's probably an easy question to answer, but, you know, I I know it from my angle at the witch side, um, we're both very deeply vested in our paths. Um, Do you find it any, any great difficulty living in the mundane world? Well, um, you know, I, so this is one of these things that <laughs> we, uh, <laughs> this is one of those things. So as wizards, we focus on the bridge between worlds. That's sort of the, the unofficial slogan, the bridge between worlds here. And we want to incorporate and build that mystique and mystery and the esoteric value of the mundane 
you know, it's only mundane because it sorts of get it gets washed out. It's so familiar that we lose our fascination and our, our magic with it. But uh, I mean, imagine life without door hinges, and man, you know, the majesty of the door hinge becomes a significant vested interest in life. <laughs> so. I think in the mundane world, there's always a chance to be a wizard. You know, as a wizard, you walk the path all the time. And uh, one of these ways, and this is a question that was presented by an apprentice of mine uh, at, our, at our last virtual conclave, mm-hmm. was, you know, out in the world, what do you, how do you wizard? What does one wizard and what does it look like? So I gave the example of being in the grocery store checkout line. Now, we've all been there. We've all been in the grocery store checkout line, and there are people behind you and people in front of you, and very, very, very rarely do you actually communicate with those people, and very rarely do they communicate with each other, and there's a really wonderful chance for connection and community building in that moment, Uh, and so I always challenge my apprentices, and it's certainly a challenge of myself, that when those opportunities present themselves, we strike up a conversation, or we work towards you know a joke and get the line laughing and the ultimate goal there is just in that moment to build a small section of time that allows the individuals present to really enjoy what it means to be alive right it's it's not in a greater sense it's not going to change everything about them but you can make that moment better you can change that moment to be one of introspection if it's necessary if you've heard something perhaps uncouth it can be one uplifting where maybe you've heard something a little grim in the line and somebody's said something and why there in that moment you have an opportunity to affect someone's life in a genuine, meaningful way. And it's about approaching it realistically and honestly. You know, you don't want to come off as a as some silly guy or a girl in a robe there in the line or not in a robe. I and mean, robes are not required, but they're quite <laughs> fashionable. So the uh, very, very, very practical object of clothing, Uh, (laughs) unless you're climbing trees, then they become a little bit of a nuisance. But the uh, the whole whole thing going forward is that you have this this moment to really connect with other people and teach them how to connect in doing so. I I hate to say it, but the world today, the mundane world, and I'm going to say it this way because we're going to talk specifically about those people who uh, refuse to connect with the world around them in any meaningful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are this is the mundane populace, you know, and, and that's not to put them down or to degrade or to do anything negative towards a group of people who don't believe the same thing I believe. It is rather to say that there is a difference here of philosophy which affects the quality of life we live. As wizards, we want to share a moment of that without pushing any philosophy, without trying to convert it. You know, it's not about that. It's about genuinely just being of service in the moment. Uh, so an example, going back to our, our line, uh, my uh, husband and I were in line down at the, what was it, the Safeway, I believe it was. So the Safeway. Mm-hmm. And there's this group of people in line, and the woman behind us has lost her dog. And I know this because she bought dog food, which she then asked the cashier to put back because she said, I've just lost my dog. I did this out of habit. So putting you know one and one together... I was able to deduce that she had lost her dog, which is a great skill of the wizard to be able to wise, do. Wise. Very yes, wise. Yes. Thank you. It was, a, it was a rough go of it, but, you know, I took the jump and I landed it fairly well. Solid 8 out of 10 on that one. So I turned to her, you know, mid-grocery bite, stick of cheese in hand. I oh. said, I am so sorry to hear that. What was your dog's name, if you don't mind my asking? And she says, well, his name was Scout. And I said, you know, that's a great name for a dog. I had a dog named Scout myself. And I just took a small moment of my day to genuinely connect with the person in front of me, or behind me in this case. Mm-hmm. The person behind her, inspired by that action, also reached out, put a hand on her shoulder and said, you know, I just recently lost a pet as well. I know how hard that can be. And, uh, you know, let me buy your groceries for you. Mm-hmm. And so these small moments are opportunities where we all connect. The cashier... Paid for paid for both their food, wow. which was which a kindness that I didn't see coming. Bam, there it was, and we have this great little moment of community. You know, maybe they don't meet each other again. Maybe they do. Maybe she comes through that line again, and there's the cashier, and she gets to share an intimate moment, a moment of friendship and meaningful connection with someone else mm-hmm. that she wouldn't have otherwise. And so wizards want to provide these moments as best we can in the world around us. 
Um, and, you know, they're not always, uh, you know, sometimes that's that same moment of passion and love and caring can take on a completely different vibe. You know, let's say uh, someone is saying something quite nasty in line and you take the moment, you take the opportunity to stand up and say something. Oh. Wizards are infamous for having opinions, which gets us into trouble all of the time. <laughs> but it's just the way of the, the can of bees, I am, I'm afraid. Mm. And one should never can bees. And so really, that's, that's where we get with that. So, uh, you know, they, there's a lot of different opportunities to be a wizard in the world. And it's really, I think, when we look at wizardry as a apprenticed into vocation in the way that one might have in years past apprenticed into doctory or into machinery or other eeries of the apprenticeship nature. You forgot you know, chicanery. Yeah, indeed, right. chicane, right? very all important ones. Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> so all of these things, you know, the the professions of the past were passed on by apprenticeship, and by learning in the way and the walk of those who came before you to kind of uh, alleviate their mistakes and improve your craft. Mm-hmm. And so the wizards, you know, today walk this path. They they take the lessons of their teachers, um, who are sometimes younger in years than them, and sometimes older. And it's a great thing to watch a wizard who is, or an apprentice wizard who's 65 years old and an apprentice wizard who is 23 year, three years old uh, approach the same lesson and approach it not as, you know, I am the high priest of so-and-such or I've done this or I've done that, but to understand that whatever path they've walked thus far has led them there and to approach that path as equals and apprentices and to bear weight to that title. I, I think it's a, it's a genuinely magical thing. It is. It absolutely is. Now, um, last time you were here, we talked about the Gray School. So um, we've got about yeah, close to 15 minutes. I want to talk about that. Um, let's talk about your position at the school, the classes you teach. Um, and then you just dropped a teasy line back away. So I think we need to get filled up on some current events over there um, <laughs> and things like that. So um, let's start with um your position the classes you teach and take it from there all right well i i am the dean of students at the gray school of wizardry as well as the assistant to the headmaster and, and several other things assistant dean of wizardry good good titles to bear certainly and i'm very humbled and honored to be all of them I, I teach predominantly in the wizardry department, but I dabble in the performance arts because one can never keep a good thespian in a box unless it's a you know a jack in the box, and then they still you know pop they out. They still so, pop out. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh-huh. It's, it's a difficult thing. So uh, I definitely dabble there in the performance magic, uh, and I I definitely am in our our major in our wizardry department. Um, and these, these are great things. You know, the classes I teach, I teach the required class, and I wrote the required class for, uh, you know, becoming an apprentice and what it means to be a wizard or a wizard's apprentice at the very least. And, you know, the path forward and the rules of wizardry and all these sorts of ideas here were discussed with our, our headmaster and I, and, you know, be able to culminate them and put them into a class that, you know, meshes more completely with uh, the world today and, and is applicable and, you know, hopefully will be relevant for years to come, uh, as we all hope. Yes. Uh, so, you know, these are the classes I'm involved in most. I teach the, the infamous uh, Staff and Scroll, which uh, grade school apprentices will realize or, or know, at least older ones will know, is a devil of a class with just a bunch of lessons. It's very hard, but it, it's good and it's good for you. So I... I stand by it, and I definitely won't let anyone fail from it. You know, an assignment might be sent back to you, but only as a rough draft, of course. You know, I'm sure the final will be lovely, and we'll we'll make it through together. Yeah. Um, so you know, and, and uh, these things are are really something else. Um, we're looking at in the years to come in the in the 2020 year, mm-hmm. our first physical conclave in many moons, wow. and uh, you know, this is an important aspect to our school, to our community, to the people who support us, is to be able to meet in person, to talk, to communicate, to have festivities and classes and events. Um, And, you know, we scoured all over for this sort of thing, and a opportunity presented itself where I might be able to, well, I will be able to secure a, a parcel of land. Currently, the one we're looking at is five acres of land. 
Um, currently in Tyler, Texas, of all places. So, you know, the, the path is strange and full of weird turns and stuff. But <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the there's a good community going on there, sort of the metaphysical variety. And um, it's three hours from Louisiana and uh, New Orleans, which is, I'm sure, you know, going to be a distraction to all my grading. But uh, <laughs> these, these sort of things will provide a physical conclave location for us for years to come and i'm happy to be able to provide that sort of opportunity for us so that we can have this little proto campus and offer these classes during our conclaves and really start to utilize the interest and availability of people nowadays to be able to do uh, these long-term uh, apprenticeships and sort of more engaged physical learning uh, you know with a lot of people now and i and i know the majority of people certainly still have what one might consider a normal job, but for many people are now moving on to the online industry and being able to take their work with them and, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a, a long-term goal for this sort of project would be to offer a summer school or a summer camp style three month sort of, you know, wizard school in person and with right. classes and, and housing and the, and the whole thing. So this is the first step towards that. That's great. Those are really good plans. Um, it's always forward, onward and upwards. And, you know, sometimes you kind of get into a, a stagnant place, but eventually something will come up and, and change that all and, and turn it upside down in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of these things that we, I teach our apprentices in this very first class, the Wizardry 100, which, <laughs> by the way, is our very first class to be a preview class uh, on our Magic Alley. So you can buy it for 10 cents and, and go through it. It was going to be free, but the software we use it makes it so that we have to charge 10 cents. And so, there, <laughs> so it's 10 cents. Uh, but you can get, you know, some of the first lessons there for that class for that. Um, but anyway, we talk about synchronicities and riding the synchronicity wave and really taking note of those moments in our life which may at first glance seem dramatic or might seem, you know, to turn us on our heels and really uproot us are really, it's just a lot of energy. And you need to remain calm, grounded and centered and focus that energy back towards uh, a, a workable and feasible future for you. Mm -hmm. But I see we're running out of time, and I, I'd love to cover the three rules of wizardry, if if that's okay with you. That's fine with me, yes. I was watching the clock myself. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. All right. So the three rules of wizardry. These are pre this is a pretty big deal. Uh, you know, my mentor would surely have my toes in a jar for this, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, he, oh, of course. Of course. Right. He's old, Thank though, you. and the Internet's hard for those of us who are further along in years. So I think we'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> so... So the three rules of wizardry. The first rule of wizardry is that a wizard always accepts responsibility for their action and takes credit for their deeds. And I think that's an easy thing to say to do and a very difficult thing to actually apply to our lives. But when we start doing that, we, we're in line with our first, first rule of wizardry. Our second rule of wizardry is that a wizard's reputation is their power. And this is a very convoluted rule because it, there's a lot of holes and caveats to it. But understanding it not as I need to gain notoriety to be powerful, I urge the on listener to rather consider it as the reputation I garner and gain through my life, through my works, through my deeds affects my power. Be mindful of the image you project and what the person and who the person you are is perceived as by not only your friends and those neutral onlookers, but also by your enemies and to be mindful of the world you create around yourself. Uh, and this of course leads us to rule three, the interconnected nature of the rules of wizardry reflecting of course, in the motto of our glorious school is that <laughs> the third rule is, uh, and it's right from our great friend Stanley and the pages of Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility, and through great responsibility comes great power. This is, you know, people look at power as a one-sided relationship with the world, one's dominance therein, or one's ability to really affect their will. But in equal measures comes the responsibility to wield it wisely, to act in accordance to those virtues and morals and, and ideals which you hold sacred and just, and to not interfere or impede upon the well-being of the world around you. 
you know, to exercise that power in a way that, A, makes the world a better place, and B, really strives its hardest to not make it a worse place for others. It's a difficult balance to walk, and this is the, the art and really the power of wizardry. That makes it sound quite powerful and quite lovely at the same time. Yeah, sure. I like that. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we were, for the for people listening in, we were talking about, he, he mentioned the three worlds of wizardry, and I said, oh, we can start that off with the show, uh, start the show off with it. And, no. Oh, no. No, no. Yeah, no, far too powerful. These are, these are <laughs> the great secrets of our order, you know. With these in hand, you could get a pretty good score on your first assignment at grade school. Look, I'm just saying. <laughs> really yeah, good so, stuff. So I, I, I learned. I learned. And speaking of learning, um, where can people find the Gray School? Where can people um, find out about the classes? Because, you know, there are not five or ten or a dozen classes. There are literally hundreds of classes, are there not? There are literally, and that word is overused, but literally hundreds <laughs> of classes. And, I mean, that's fact- fantastic. It blows the mind. It boggles the tongue. It just yeah. like that song from the beginning and the people who made it, which would I was trying to say while well, you were reading, and I just thought, wow, that is, that's tongue twistery is what that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's the whole field available there. Um, with regards to, you know, our 600 classes, we have 16 departments and instructors from all over the world who are talented in ways that are just, I mean, and I, I hate to use this as a comparison because we often get kind of accused of being a role play school or sort of a LARP because we are we have a very similar structure to the Hogwarts of, of the Harry Potter mythos. Mm-hmm. But if you imagine for a moment the divination teacher, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm not going to go any further with that, but I'm just saying that yeah. we all pretty we fit our roles pretty well. <laughs> and we've got some pretty amazing members of our faculty that just are unique. They're self-made individuals who really have strived to perfection in their own worlds. Uh, we have a very talented um, the uh, uh, poisoner, of all things, and he's just grand. We've got a very talented uh, uh, apothecary who does Instagram work. Uh, hoodoo and and just across the board. I mean, we have healers and diviners and wizards who do wizard stuff. I mean, it's all good news, really, all in the end. And um, it's it's one of these experiences that I think, with with the new tuition, with the monthly tuition thing continuing on as it was last time, I think it's one of those things that if you don't give it a try. Uh, and, and you know, it's not for everyone. But if you don't give it a try, at least for yourself, you'll always wonder. You know, what if you know, maybe I could have been a wizard. And I think that's a thing that you should at least, you know, investigate. <laughs> that's it. You miss out on a lot if you haven't tried it before. Now, where where can, uh, where can is the school? Give us the website and give us your website as well, please. Uh, yes, of course, I have uh, a website this time, which I thought was pretty swell. Uh, so <laughs> you can, of course, get to the Gray School at www.grayschool.com. It's gray, the American way, uh, because we're fancy like that. So it's G-R-E-Y school.com. Uh, and you can find me at thewizardkingsley.com, although, uh, so I'll be moving to Texas, of course, so that information there will change. But that won't be till uh, October sometime. So if people are looking for me in the Portland metro area, I'll be around till then. All right. Quick nod to the headmaster, please, because some people do not know who he is. Oh, of course. Headmaster Oberon Zell is, a, is just a rock star in the pagan community. Certainly, uh, if not the founder, one of the big founders of the pagan movement and a huge huge role model of myself and many other wizards the world over um you can find more information about him at i believe the wizard oz.com let me just check that real quick right and while you're while you're checking i'm going to thank everybody for being here tonight and that includes you um (laughs) it was a really good show it went by really really quickly and um thank you all for being here Ah, yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's obronzell.com. I apologize. There we go. <laughs> and, and, uh, yes, thank you. 
And until next time, everybody, blessed be and merry meet again. Good night. Thank you for tuning into this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2019. The Mysterioso March by Kevin McLeod is licensed through incompotech.com. <laughs>